All right, well, I'll start with an apology. If you hear any voice cracking tonight, I'm sorry. It's not puberty. That was last year. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just on the tail end of, uh, of an irritating illness. Uh, but my name is Matt Carroll. I'm a developer on the Flutter Framework team at Google. Um, and if you find anything I'm saying tonight interesting, you can follow me on Twitter at F-L-T-T-R-Y. Also, if my monotony excites you, you can watch me live code complex user interfaces in Flutter on YouTube at the channel called Fluttery. And apparently I've titled this talk Flutter vs. Web. I don't know why I made it so aggressive. It's not supposed to be. But I'm going to try to talk about Flutter as much as possible from a web developer's perspective to the degree that I understand web development. But before I get into the presentation, can I see a show of hands? Who in here is a native Android developer? Okay, native iOS developer. Web for desktop or mobile? Okay, vast majority. So there's a little bit of stuff in here for you mobile developers, but again, most of it is tailored towards the web. So I'd first like to look at a spectrum of mobile options from mobile web all the way over to native. So I'm sure, as you all know, you can choose to build a web app and simply deploy it via the browser as like any other web app, any other website optimized for a mobile screen. You can take that same web app and you can package it in an APK or an IPA. This gives you some control over the Chrome and it allows you to access the hardware if need be, but it's essentially the same application. And then we enter the world of React Native, which brings in web technologies largely for the purpose of sharing business logic, rules, processes, presentation logic. But in React Native, you actually assemble and control a platform UI. And then lastly, of course, there's what we would consider traditional native development or platform development, where you use Java or Kotlin on Android, Objective-C or Swift on iOS. And this kind of begs the question, where does Flutter live in this spectrum or ecosystem? And the truth is it doesn't live anywhere on this particular spectrum because there are zero web technologies in Flutter, uh, and yet it's not what we would call native development in the sense of Java, Kotlin, Objective-C, Swift. So let's take a different tack, and let's talk about the pros of each side of the spectrum. On web, we gain code or shared code, so you can write some of your business rules once and reuse them between platforms. You receive the ability to push changes to your application on your schedule. You don't necessarily go through store reviews and things like that. You can build with reactive UIs, and though some might say that React Native brings that to mobile, within a truly platform or native context, there still is no support for this in mobile. Now, if you're building on the platform, you're going to get uh, very fast rendering, high performance rendering. You're going to have full access to all hardware the way it's meant to be consumed. And you're going to, of course, by default, get the platform look and feel. What Flutter does is give you almost all of these, with perhaps the exception of code push. And there are some technical challenges to code push. There are also some app store and play store rules and regulation limitations to code push. We might see it at some point, but it's not there today. But the rest of all of this is provided by Flutter. So now let's talk about what Flutter actually is. So Flutter is a portable UI toolkit that's meant to help developers build high quality user experiences across multiple platforms. And obviously these us this user interface right here was built with Flutter. I'd be kind of a jerk if it wasn't, right? <laughs> But here's what we, what we really mean by high quality. You can paint every single pixel on the screen. We don't give you a particular layout to stick with. We don't give you a particular representation of widgets that you have to use. You can paint every pixel. What this then leads to is you have full customization control of your apps. If you want your app to look like an iOS app, that's up to you. If you want it to look like an Android app, that's up to you. But if you want it to look like neither of those, and you want it to be branded to your company, your team, your product, being able to paint every pixel delivers that ability. And something that's near and dear to my heart, and a philosophy that is present uh, within the Flutter framework, is the notion that you should never have to say no to a designer. I was a professional Android app developer for about seven years before joining the Flutter framework team, 
and I said no to customers, and I said no to designers. It was a commonplace thing, because the engineering effort to achieve what they wanted to achieve wasn't worth it. Didn't mean it was a bad idea. I would have liked to have done it, but I couldn't justify the effort, the time, the money. The way Flutter builds UIs, I think you'll find that you never have to do that again. So there's also the development experience. Now, with many of you working on the web, this isn't necessarily new to you, but in mobile, this is new and it's a game changer. The notion that you can make some changes in your code, press save, and within a second, those visual changes are reflected on your emulator, your simulator, or your physical device. This allows you to put a designer right next to you in the office and say, what do you want? Let's try it together right now. This not only makes the development experience more interesting and more fruitful, but it even changes how organizations work internally. So I'm also going to tell you a little bit, and this is unofficial, this is my personal viewpoint, but where I see the future of application development going. And um, it, even today, Flutter is a great option for iOS and Android. If I was building a new app, zero chance that I don't use Flutter. But as we speak, there's an experimental desktop embedder for Flutter. Now it's not, again, it's not official, and it's not production ready, but I expect it to get there, and I expect to personally use it for projects. And at that point, you're writing the same Flutter app with relatively minor differences, and you're deploying it to iOS, Android, Linux, Mac, and Windows, which is generally not something you can say about any other technology, not with the same level uh, of similarity between the different versions of that app. But it doesn't stop there. In December, the Flutter team announced an internal effort to bring Flutter to web. This isn't a Flutter variant. This isn't Flutter plus HTML and CSS. This is the same widget code that you wrote for mobile and desktop running in a web app. And of course, even now, you have the ability to write command line apps using Dart. In fact, the Flutter command line tool is written in Dart. And you heard earlier that there's even a blog post that shows you how to embed a Flutter app on a Raspberry Pi. So what I see here is a vector that says Flutter is going to go to every platform that wants it, and it's going to be a first-class citizen. It's not going to be a variant or an amalgamation. You're going to get Flutter wherever you want it. And given that we're talking about one language and one framework, it seems to me that we are likely to see all application development across all of these platforms begin to move to Flutter. That's not an official prediction, it's just my personal one. Um, and again, I, my entire career pretty much was a an native Android app developer. I left that in a heartbeat to go join the Flutter framework team when I realized that this was the direction that I thought things were moving in. Now, for you mobile people, I wanted to explain to you how Flutter actually gets into mobile. It kind of feels like magic at first, but if you look under the covers a little bit, it's very simple. Any mobile developer will be familiar with activities on Android and view controllers on iOS. Moreover, and for those of you who don't know, an activity and a view controller essentially own the window. Anything you're doing on the screen is within one of those artifacts. An activity and a view controller each then have a view hierarchy. And if you build the typical mobile app UI, it looks something like this. You lay things out vertically, and then each view on the screen contains other views, and you have this hierarchy. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with just having a single view on the screen that takes up the whole screen. In fact, if you've ever written an app that launches a web view, that's probably exactly what you did. You probably launched a new activity, or a new view controller, and had a full screen web view. Well, it doesn't have to be a web view either. Let's say it might be a surface view on Android and a subclass of UI view on iOS. And let's say that all that view does is copy a GL texture from the GPU to the screen. For example, let's say maps are sitting in the GPU, and then we just copy that texture directly to the screen. Or let's say, that your app involves video. That video is not being decoded in Java or Objective-C, in all likelihood. It's being decoded to a texture on the GPU, which we can then copy to the screen. And where you can probably see I'm going with this is, why can't Flutter do the same thing? Why can't Flutter take all your Dart code, your widgets, your render objects, 
draw to a GL texture, and then render that, copy it directly to the screen. That's exactly what it does. That's exactly how Flutter finds its way into Android and iOS. And, what, and this is part of the reason why the rendering that Flutter does is not impacted at all by the platform, because there is no Android SDK view or UI view subclass that's controlling this. In fact, Flutter isn't even directly painting the pixels on the screen, it's painting a texture in the GPU, and that's then copied to the screen. Uh, so I also want to talk to you about reactive widgets a little bit. You, you saw some live coding earlier, so hopefully this won't be too foreign. And I'm about to probably butcher a concept that all of you know very well, so please bear with me. And that's the notion of the shadow DOM. So as a mobile developer, I'm going to mobile explain to you how the shadow DOM works, but then I'm going to relate it back to Flutter. So my understanding, at least, of the shadow DOM which we'll represent by the darker of the trees and the regular DOM by the red tree because it's dangerous, you don't want to touch it, that it is cheap to build a JavaScript data structure. And so that you can use that JavaScript data structure to represent the UI that you want to see on the, in the browser at any given time. What's very expensive is manipulating the DOM, that it triggers layout and rendering passes. If you have a bunch of different components all manipulating that DOM, you start adding up a lot of extra work that you don't really need. So let's say you want to change what the browser is displaying. You'll get rid of your current JavaScript data structure, and you'll introduce another one that contains some number of changes. And then in one fell swoop, you will move that tree over to the DOM, and the DOM mutates essentially in one go. Everything I just said, minus the terminology, is true in Flutter except instead of the DOM and the shadow DOM, the shadow DOM is actually those widgets that you saw Abraham declaring in the previous presentation. And then, after that whole tree is done being built, it gets pushed into the Flutter framework, handed off to Flutter, and Flutter mutates actually multiple trees, an element tree, a render object tree, an accessibility tree. 99% of the time, you don't need to worry about that process, you just write the widgets. But it's the same kind of movement of a tree which gives you, one, uh, higher performance in rendering, and two, it allows you to define the UI declaratively. And you've already seen this, but this is what we mean by declarative UI. We instantiate widgets, we give their properties values, and we never ever mutate them. So if we want a 50 by 50 square that's red at the center of the screen, center of the screen we create a center widget, we give it a container as a child. We tell that container to be 50 by 50 and tell it to be red. And if we want to change the color from red to blue, for example, we don't say container.color equals blue. And we don't even say center.child equals new container. We just rebuild this entire subtree, and instead of passing in red for the color, we pass in blue. And again, that new subtree is passed through the Flutter framework and applied to the existing rendering system. Um, you guys have already seen some live coding. You saw more than I was going to show you anyways, um, so I'll skip that. And I'll just leave you guys with these handy links. And with that, thanks for listening. <laughs>